Good afternoon. My name is Brandon Dillard, and I'm the manager of historic interpretation here at Monticello. You might recognize my voice because in previous live streams, I'm usually the guy behind the camera, and I'm reading questions from our audience as they come in so that we can directly engage with you while we're talking to our first person interpreter actor, uh, Bill Barker, who portrays Thomas Jefferson. We wanted to do something a little bit different this week. Given the national conversation and given events all around us, we know that 2020 has been a challenging year. Monticello has been closed for months. We reopened this weekend due to a global pandemic. And in recent weeks in the United States, millions of people all over the country are actively fighting for equity against different forms of racial injustice, whether it's racially motivated police violence or racially motivated monuments and memories. It's a conversation that we must engage in. And working here at Monticello, we are a site of memory. And Monticello was a plantation where over 400 people were enslaved. Today, we decided that to have a conversation, we would do something that we haven't done, and I'm sure everyone knows this, that when you tune in, you're, you're not actually talking to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, you're talking to, again, as I said, my friend Bill, uh, who portrays Thomas Jefferson. And Bill is gonna join us today. Uh, when he does so, he will be out of character. We talked about this uh, before we would go live as to how we would best address this subject. And we thought that perhaps a good idea would be to talk about the challenge of interpreting slavery explicitly. And obviously, Bill and I, when we talk about this, we, we recognize that we are both white men. And we're talking about something that greatly impacts people of color and black Americans. This Friday is Juneteenth, which marks a day of remembrance in this country for the end of slavery. And it's a day that all Americans should celebrate in knowing that this is an institution that legally ended. But that institution legally ending was not the end of its legacies. Slavery has always existed, and slavery still exists. But the kind of slavery that existed at Monticello, race-based slavery that developed through the transatlantic slave trade and into the early United States, was inextricably intertwined with concepts, developing concepts of race, the lasting legacies of which we still struggle today, and the systems that we're still trying to dismantle. We believe, Bill and I, that we must engage this conversation. And Monticello is engaging this conversation and inviting others to do the same. I'll still be accepting questions online, and Bill and I will try to answer those as best we can. But today, we believe we're going to use this time to invite you all to join us in this, and understanding that we do have privilege as white men and as such a duty to engage in a conversation about all of our shared pasts and help us understand how the history of the past determines who we are today. So Bill, uh, I think we should start with just a little explanation of what a first person interpreter is. So can you tell us what does a first person interpreter do and what do you do here at Monticello? Well, thank you, Brandon, and thank all of you for, uh, for coming to, to talk about, uh, to speak with, and importantly, listen to. Because uh, in my vocation, it is an element of theater. You cannot extricate it from theater. And what is so important to realize in our conversation uh, this is no mere 
intermission uh, of a show. This is no on track. Uh, this is the reality uh, of our times and uh, of past times, and this conversation continues. And in my capacity as a historic interpreter, the theater is, as Shakespeare said, the thing. The play is the thing often to, um, to spark and to uh, provoke uh, the mind of the king, to help us look at ourselves. Shakespeare in particular succeeds in, um, in his plays to hold up a mirror in which we can see our human nature. And it's nonetheless in historic interpretation. So my vocation in interpreting Thomas Jefferson, and that is what it has been and what I have done for nearly 40 years, is to put on the vestments, but also the theater of Mr. Jefferson to help us think and to help us better understand our past and particularly who we are as Americans and, uh, and to engage that conversation, certainly as he would want. So you've made reference uh, that you've done this for a number of years. Um, and our topic today about interpreting slavery, talking about slavery, uh, it's so relevant, but it has been an ongoing part of conversations at Monticello for a long time at historic sites throughout the world. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how it's changed from your perspective over the years, this interpretation of slavery? Yes, we're, we're, we're talking about it now. And, and we had been talking about it for a few years, but not for the 40 years in which I've been involved. Uh, and imagine, I, I'm a child of the 60s, so I grew up in talking about this, and, and we go in and out of it, in and out of it, but at historic sites, as I began this, at uh, Independence Hall in Philadelphia, yes, there was mention of slavery, but uh, it was not engaged thoroughly, and I'm going back uh, 40 years. Uh, when I went to Colonial Williamsburg in the spring of 1993, Williamsburg had already embarked uh, for several years upon the discussion of slavery. There was the African American Interpretive uh, Group at Colonial Williamsburg, and I welcomed that opportunity to work with them uh, to better explain this story and enact uh, the story uh, of our history. Uh, Monticello had embarked at the same time upon speaking uh, on slavery and continues as Colonial Williamsburg and many other living history museums and national historic sites uh, across our country continues to speak about this the more and more, engage this, but most and particularly what's so important, to acknowledge it, to acknowledge it and, uh, and struggle with it. We need to struggle with this. A first person interpreter is limited uh, to the character, the time period uh, that they must portray. And actually in, in conversations preparing for this week, uh, one of the things that you and I discussed is uh, a great example, Juneteenth is something that Thomas Jefferson during his life would know nothing about. So can you, can you talk for just a minute about the challenges of staying in character when talking about slavery in particular? The big challenge uh, in interpreting Thomas Jefferson would be for a visitor to say, Mr. Jefferson, what do you think about Juneteenth? And for Mr. Jefferson to reply, what is Juneteenth? And this allows the visitor, the guest, to explain it to him. So here's a wonderful opportunity to speak with our past and for the past to speak with the future, to come to an understanding that Mr. Jefferson learns from the future and with the hope that the future may learn, well, if you are referring to a time in which we've finally ended slavery, uh, what did it take then for that to come about? Would Mr. Jefferson want to know what it took for that to come about. We know that, uh, and what I can talk about in persona are his predictions, what could happen uh, 
he did make statements in his letters, and that's my job to interpret those letters and the conversations we know he had and the interactions with uh, those of his period. But it becomes even more a struggle for him as it does for us to ponder what it took and then for Mr. Jefferson to understand what it continues to take. You've kind of answered this a little bit with, with that question. Um, it makes me think about this, though, given the limitations of, of staying in character. Uh, there are strategies, of course, that you all implement to get more complete messages across. And I, I work as an interpreter, but not as a first-person interpreter. So uh, I think that people would call me a tour guide, uh, but not someone who dresses in a costume or is bound by the times. So could you share some strategies with us about how you bridge that gap? Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the strategies for helping us to better understand where we have been rest in the reiteration and continuing conversation about our nation's founding principles. Uh, I always uh, prefer to introduce uh, Mr. Jefferson as writing what George Washington referred to as the, the promise, the Declaration of American Independence, as something that does not include anything new or original. That it is the representation of the accumulation of man's eternal history in the struggle for liberty. Now, that is considered man's eternal struggle for liberty in Jefferson's time, that has gone on. And the fact that our promise, our declaration, in an expression of the American mind, uh, submits these facts to a candid world. One of my strategies in, in that introduction is to remind people that we achieved the first nation in the history of man founded upon principle, not upon monarchy, not upon nobility, landed gentry, aristocracy, principles of inalienable rights, unalienable rights in nature that every individual is entitled to. <laughs> is that the experience in his day? No, it is not. But he wrote it, and it's our founding principle, and it's our blueprint from which we can continue to struggle and, and have the conversation and pursue that, uh, that equality. I remind people as, uh, as a strategy that we brought 13 individual nations together to remind us these former colonies were nations unto themselves with differences of religious opinion in one different from another. Uh, with slavery, the, the uh, overwhelming experience in many, but not in others that we brought this all together, e pluribus unum, again, to work this out in a recognition that two heads are better than one, three heads better than two, that a house divided cannot stand. That's an ancient principle of unity. And to help us understand that uh, egalitarianism, providing an equal opportunity, is, is not a socialism. It's an equal opportunity. It's an opportunity for everyone to be able to achieve the pursuit of their happiness, to be happy. And to understand that freedom is not free, it requires an eternal vigilance in order to reflect upon these founding principles. So those are initial strategies that I try to engage at the very beginning and then quite obviously the conversation will continue. So uh, we are starting to get some questions in from the audience. This is a great one. Student groups are by far the, the most diverse uh, ethnically, racially, economically groups that visit Monticello. And we see uh, in normal times, we see you know, tens of thousands of students each year. Bridget uh, from online wants to know how you go about addressing sensitive topics like slavery when you're interpreting in front of a younger audience and particularly school age children. Well, Bridget, I can tell you, uh, it's always been my experience to realize that the, the young are very sensitive to begin with and have a great common sense and understanding out of the mouth of babes. 
And where better to engage this conversation, if only to begin it with many who have been thinking about it, that they can continue to think about it and can continue to engage it. Um, for a student and to ask Mr. Jefferson about slavery opens the door. It's very sincere, it's very innocent, it's obvious. And we approach it. And we speak about it, we speak with, and we listen to. So I welcome students. I, I've been going out to schools for more than 40 years, and uh, I can tell you that it is the most satisfying work, particularly when greeting them here at Monticello, as I was able to do at Colonial Williamsburg. And uh, this is how we touch our past. This is how we prepare our future. So these are opportunities in the persona, in our past, to speak with the future. This one uh, is interesting. Uh, so Zach uh, wants to know, if, do you find that people assume your views are Thomas Jefferson's views? Uh, is it hard for, for people to differentiate between the two of you? And, and I have a follow-up. Do you ever wish you could answer as Bill instead of as Thomas Jefferson? Let me ask the answer the second part. Of course I wish I could answer as Bill, but uh, I, 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 I'm in my persona, I'm in my job, I'm, I'm in my vocation, I'm in my, my duty to teach history, to interpret history, but certainly not to justify uh, Mr. Jefferson's opinions. Uh, I, I expose his opinions, I, I speak about his opinions, but uh, I also speak about his achievements and I, I speak about his, his vision. And, and most importantly, too, uh, to, to reveal that he changed his mind as he grew older. To help us understand, we all change our minds as we grew older. And you, know, you read Jefferson, and he'll let you know, I once thought this, I now think that. And it, it's helped me to keep in touch with him, and particularly to help me better understand uh, how day to day, uh, what we meet and what challenges us challenges preconceived ideas. I think that this is a very challenging one, and a couple of people have asked questions that relate to it, but you just opened the door for it by saying that it's not your job to justify Jefferson's writings. John asked about notes on the state of Virginia. And any scholar of Jefferson knows that Query 14 and Notes of the State of Virginia, where he describes his opinions on race, is the crucial element to understanding slavery. And you made me think of this earlier as well when you said that it's changed the way that we talk about slavery. And even in my short time in the field, I've only done this for 10 years, but the way that we talk about race at historic sites and in the public discourse has changed. 10 years ago, systemic racism, understanding white privilege, these were not broadly known conversations outside of academic discourse. Let's talk for a minute about notes on the state of Virginia, and let's talk about another point that someone brings up, which is a complicated question, Cash, talking about how, as public historians, we can help a 21st century audience who finds this as morally abhorrent and still understand the context for it. I think that's race. I think it's clear in Notes of the State of Virginia. But can you talk a bit about how Jefferson would write about these things without justifying what Jefferson wrote? If someone, and they have many times, uh, asked Mr. Jefferson about his notes on the State of Virginia, you'll certainly see a remorse to begin with. You'll certainly see an effort perhaps to dodge speaking any further about the question, but uh, he's not going to dodge it. He's going to approach it. And as he later does in life, he's going to apologize for it. Uh, he does this in a letter to uh, uh, Henri Grigor, uh, who becomes a very well-known French abolitionist. It is in a letter Jefferson writes uh, February uh, of 1809, but even this remark is not meant to be an excuse. It's a revelation 
of the struggles that Mr. Jefferson was going through as we continue to go through when we read these notes. A further revelation is the fact that we know these now. We know Jefferson's notes on the Virginia. Uh, he did not write them to be published extensively. Uh, he wrote the notes collectively in answer to a questionnaire that was put out by uh, uh, the Marquis Barbet de Moiblois uh, to the colony of Virginia. They were like questionnaires to put, put out to all of the former colonies so that France could become better aware of information, animal, vegetable, and mineral, particularly uh, to investing in the American Revolution. So Jefferson had accumulated notes already, and he gathered these all together when he went to France, and there in France, uh, he had them published in French privately and handed out to gentlemen of scientific curiosity. Well, quite naturally, it got out of their hands, it was published, and there it was. Uh, so there's a background. That's not a justification for them. It's a revelation of them. A further revelation within these notes, Jefferson makes bold statements, not only about race, but also religion. He makes bold statements about habits and customs. He makes bold statements about particular proper names that he alone has ascribed to elements in nature. Uh, flora and fauna. He answers much of these, uh, much of the, the questions of, from Marbois, uh, Marbois de Marbe, uh, Barbe, he answers them with questions too. So here is the scientist, here's the revelation of the scientist who writes very early on, and I believe it's in notes, be so bold to question everything follow truth wherever it should lead us. And again, these are not justifications, they're revelations of this information. And we struggle with it, as we should, and he did, and we try to reconcile it. Can it be reconciled? I've never been able to. We just got a comment that I think is very relevant to what you just said and also the, the conversation at hand. And I'll preface it by saying, this is an emotionally charged subject for a lot of people. And I can offer the best possible proof of that to all of our Facebook audience members. Look at the comments. Um, people have strong feelings about this. And those feelings run across the board and are particularly addressed towards this history and the way that we talk about this history. Some people uh, clearly say that we are trying to tear down the history of a great man uh, by remembering slavery. Others say that we uh, are trying to celebrate a singular narrative of a, of a white man. Um, and, and we welcome that discourse. But, but Dylan asks this question, and I think this is very pertinent for you, when you're out there, you can see these emotions in people. How do, you, how do you help mitigate that while you're in character, helping people, audience members, grapple with their own emotions? I only hesitate because I'm looking for the word, uh, and, and I use it frequently in persona. This is the duty of an American citizen. It's our duty. Uh, it is we the people who hold the reins of our government. We the people who are responsible for the American conversation. This is exactly the foundation upon which the American Revolution was engaged as the British will want to play on the surrender field at Yorktown, the event that turned the world upside down. The recognition by John Locke and others that uh, a monarch is not put on the throne by divine right. Uh, the motto of uh, the royal family in Great Britain is, is Diu et Mondroit. You can still see it cut on the escutcheons of the uh, coat of arms on the governor's palace in Colonial Williamsburg. God is my right, I'm here by divine right. No, it is the people, the people from which a leader then emanates 
If there were no people, the government would govern over no one. So it is the people who not only provide the purpose, but the power for government. This is our conversation. It always has been our conversation. And, and it, it, histriology will tend to it one way in a particular period, it will tend to it in another, but we continue to revolve through this, and in my opinion, evolve, to be able to work this out, and that is, that is my hope, that's why I continue to do this. Uh, retirement's not a word in my vocabulary, nor was it a word in Mr. Jefferson's vocabulary. He left 40 years of public service at 65 years old uh, to devote his time to found a university, and, uh, and would that he could have succeeded as well in ending slavery altogether, and we know that the Coles brothers approached him on that. And what did he reply to them as he entered his eighth decade? Uh, this is on the shoulders of your generation, the young generation. Again, this is no excuse, but it is a revelation of his thought upon the subject. So, again, I think this is our duty. I think this is what of necessity we must do as the people hold the reins of government. And thank heaven we have a, a system of government uh, in our Constitution, what George Washington referred to as the guarantee of our promise, the Declaration of American Independence, a system of government, the first line of which is we, the people. What a wonderful honor and what a wonderful obligation, in my opinion. You, you spoke a bit there about the history of history, the, the idea that history is a set set of facts is, is not exactly right. And we, we learn, the more we learn about history, the more we learn that history almost says as much about the times in which it is written as the times in which it is trying to describe or understand. There is an aspect of Jefferson's history that I think we should definitely address when it comes to talking about slavery. And it is one of the reasons why Jefferson's history and the history of Monticello is such a compelling lens. And that is, of course, the, the fact that Jefferson fathered children with a woman who he owned as property. Monticello has, for years, addressed what this relationship between Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson meant, so much so that we grapple over the use of the term relationship. We talk about what it means. We talk about how any kind of conversation about consent between a master and a slave could exist, and how we'll never actually know anything about the feelings one way or another. But this conversation and the recognition of, of Jefferson as Hemings' children's father happened 22 years ago. There was a DNA study. Uh, this DNA study did not prove that Thomas Jefferson was the father, and no one ever claimed that it did. Uh, what the DNA study did is it provided a significant data point, uh, a piece of corroboratory evidence with which historians changed their perspective. I want to know what it was like for you, because you were interpreting Thomas Jefferson at the time. Mm -hmm. Could you talk for a minute about how that news spread? and what people's reactions were. Well, I can tell you that um, I distinctly remember in September of 1997, there was a seminar held here at Monticello. And um, actually the historians and interpreters of Jefferson sites, Independence Hall, the Jefferson Memorial, uh, See, the National Park Service was represented also at, uh, at Bert Williamsburg was, was there, I was there uh, as well. And um, in our collective conversation, uh, it was mentioned that the DNA study uh, in the process for several years was soon to be revealed in its, in its final statement. So we want you to understand this, that this is going to come about in our studies and in our conversation to be very, very effective. And uh, we all wondered when. And it, it came out, uh, many of you may recall, on the front page of the Washington Post 
uh, Sunday edition, and it was, I think, the first Sunday in November 1997. I was walking uh, to the Capitol building in Williamsburg to, to have a program, and a number of people were gathered around saying, Mr. Jefferson, have you seen this? Have you seen this? And uh, what is it? And I, I read it, and I, I remember saying, well, I will follow science wherever it should lead us. There's the first person interpreted response to something like that, and yet wondering at the same time, what would this lead to in that group of people there? Well, what it led to was someone making a remark that was politically explosive, and uh, there then began an engagement amongst all of those people there, and they forgot Mr. Jefferson was part of it, and I was able to turn around and go off to my program. That was the beginning. Uh, it has never ended, and uh, of course we know Mr. Jefferson never said anything about it, but what I just mentioned, a revelation, I will follow science wherever it should lead us, is what has brought us further into this conversation. Where will science go from here and, and beyond? DNA is one of the most remarkable elements of science that still continues in its further perfection. It is extraordinary. And what does it show? Something that Jefferson and many others were discussing in his day. Are we all interrelated? Are we all, as the natives would want to suggest, a family of man across the globe? Um, there are many who are cautious to allow their DNA to be taken. I find it the most marvelous thing to help us understand better that we are all connected, that you, I, I even question race. We're all one race. That's a, that's a great segue, actually, for this next question, because it is true. And this is something that, that we often see with visitors to Monticello, this conversation about race. What does race mean? And you know, a DNA test, it can't tell you your race, right? Because race is not scientifically based. Race is a social construct. Well, what does that mean, right? It means that race was created by human beings to categorize other human beings. And of course, that happened during the transatlantic slave trade. Now, when we look at that and we have that conversation, we can easily say race does not exist scientifically. But politically, it very much does. And the realities of how people are treated because of the color of their skin are different. I've known about you and the work that you do for years since I started in this, and you are very well respected. And so I knew that you'd done a lot of reading and a lot of studying, but when you came here and started working with us, I was blown away at the amount of knowledge that you have. And so you've been a, a student of history for, for a long time. People ask this, and so I'm gonna ask you, to just address it. Slavery and racism today, are they connected? They certainly are. Of course they are. I remind people in persona that though Jefferson's paternal line had been settled in Virginia from the early 17th century, though his maternal line is settled in Virginia in the mid-17th century, that that does not make Mr. Jefferson any the more American than those who continue to arrive here to make for a better life for themselves and their families. I help people remember that it was, though we were colonies of England, it was not only the Englishmen coming here. That, that many escaping the kingdoms of the Italies, uh, the kingdoms of the Germanies. In fact, Jefferson writes when he's sailing down the Rhine to Mr. Madison from everything that I, to Mr. Madison, from everything I now see, which I've already seen in my native land, I believe next to the English, the Germans make up a greater portion of our population. Well, in Virginia, Jefferson should have thought for a moment, hmm, well, in, in Williamsburg, that I've known for 20 years, uh, every other face on the Duke of Gloucester Street 
is African American. That the great population of Virginia is, is nearly 50% of African American at the time that he is going to write the Declaration of American Independence. So I remind people as we talk about when their ancestors may have arrived, and what about the African American? Did not the first ship bearing African Americans sail into the Chesapeake Bay in 1619, and that was not of their own free will and volition. They were slaves, and they have been here many, many generations already. But the point of the matter is, in the founding of our nation, we began to realize before the American Revolution began that we are becoming the less and less British and the more and more, and the answer, American. And then the problem begins. Because who are representing Americans? The white male freeholder, 21 years of age or older. That's Jefferson. That's his society. So that, that is what is governing our new nation and continues to govern our new nation even when we have 22 states before Jefferson passes away. Generally, throughout our country, it is the white male freeholder. The freeholder meaning someone who owns outright his property that has the vote, that has the say. You look at our history and you see that the admitting of states, and this is a result of the Northwest Ordinance, finds one from the North, oh, but the next one is going to come from the South. Then the one after that from the North and the next one from the South. And this continues, of course, until we've got a question we have to grapple with, admitting the North of Massachusetts, known as the Maine, and Missouri, which falls distinctly in the center of the West, uh, 3630. So how do we balance this? What are we going to do? Well, who's going to provide the answer? The white male freeholder, compromising, kicking the can. And that's when, as we began this conversation, we know Jefferson wrote to one of the first two senators in Maine, uh, Holmes, I think it's Jonathan Holmes, this could be a fire bell in the night. It could call the knell of our union. Oh, I fear, do not see that speck on our horizon. You know, I, and we, we know that part, and very few of us know the second part. I thank my creator I will not have to live and see it because he knows all too well I will spend the rest of my days weeping over the neglect of the grandsons who have forgotten entirely the principles in our declaration. That's one generation between the founding fathers and those who contend at Gettysburg. One generation. It's an ancient adage Jefferson knew well. Man is always one generation removed from barbarism. If you forget, you fall backward. What if we had had a universal system of education before Jefferson passed away? Where the child of Massachusetts as well in Virginia, the child in, in the Missouri Territory, let alone the child in Georgia or Connecticut, could all be learning these founding principles at the same time, grappling and understanding, but wait a minute, it's still only the white male freeholder, women, certainly should not be allowed to vote. Yes, systemic racism is still with us despite everyone having that opportunity to vote. Or do and does everyone have that opportunity and freely able to attend to it? This ongoing conversation and the national conversation as well. It reminds me of something James Baldwin wrote 60 years ago. Uh, this country is celebrating the end of the Civil War 100 years too soon, celebrating 100 years after the war, 100 years too soon. And you're, you're talking about this long, ongoing struggle, and it's so broad, and it impacts many people in different ways, and women and American Indian people, uh, other people of color, the, all of these conversations, poor people, people who don't own their own land, they intersect in different ways. 
And it's an ongoing conversation that I hope we continue to have. We have time for one last question today. And I think that it's one that applies very much. What's your hope for historic sites and interpreters like yourself? What role can you play in this conversation moving forward? Reminding us of who we are as Americans. Reminding us of that. It's a, you made this statement earlier. This is an emotional conversation. And it ought to be an emotional conversation. Because being an American is the most wonderful experience if you have, if you have all of those rights which you are entitled to under na nature and nature's God to pursue your happiness. Where else in the history of the world? That's why we're peopled with so many who continue to come here. And if you want to feel the emotion even more, please attend to a naturalization ceremony. Monticello continues to offer that. Poplar Forest offers that. Uh, uh, Independence Hall offers that. And listen to the people who raise their right hand and take the oath of allegiance to our nation while they forego any further allegiance to their nation. That they may someday have to take up arms against the nation of their birth. And then realize that what they are learning about our history, and particularly of slavery, is already our charge, and has been since we, we started this nation. And that I, I hope and I know has been the, uh, the pursuit and the effort of historic sites, our national historic sites, uh, to remind us of this great honor as an American, to remind us of our duty to continue to struggle with it and to make for a more perfect union. Thank you, Bill. And, and thank you all uh, for joining us today. And I'd like to close just by saying that this conversation is pertinent to us at Monticello, and it's pertinent to the world. And Monticello itself tries to foster these dialogues. Uh, we invite you to join us in these conversations. We've opened again to the public, and we hope that in coming months, we'll see some better changes, uh, some normalcy return to our country as we advance, hopefully through scientific defense against this disease. And we also hope to foster this kind of civic engagement that is so essential to self-governance and a fight for equity. And we believe that Monticello is a place that can allow that because of exactly what it is. The home of the man who said all men are created equal, who yet owned human beings. It's a lens through which we can understand how this country can exist based on the highest ideals of freedom and equality while being created on some of the most devastating realities of American Indian removal, of enslavement of people of African descent. And this continuing fight for equity, equality, for justice, that is most American. And the active participation in our governments through civil discourse, through protest, that's also a duty. Join us again tomorrow as we continue this conversation with other colleagues, Gail Jessup White and Naya Bates at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And Come back and see us again, and stay tuned to Monticello, because we'll keep having this conversation moving forward. Thank you.